love on you as you love on us. And we just give this morning to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. 
Praise God, eh? Yeah. Amen. Let's enter into worship today. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We bless you. We want to come before your throne of grace today, Lord. Lord, I just pray that you show up, O oh God, within our lives. Change hearts, O oh God. Change lives. Give us, Father God, the, uh, what we need, the revelation of Jesus Christ today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. We have announcements, uh, but we'll show them after. Let's just enter into the worship. Amen. your 
rejoice and be glad in it today. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day. dwelling place O oh Lord Almighty for my soul longs and even faints for you for here my heart is satisfied
It also says, I'd rather be a gatekeeper, which is, means I'd rather have a lowly life, a lowly job with you than live with riches but in the tents of the wicked. And I know sometimes we strive to find success in this earthly life and that's all good but let's just remember that that will all pass away let's make sure that our relationship with Jesus Christ is in order first because that's eternal Your dwelling place, O oh Lord Almighty, for my soul longs and even faints for you. For here my heart is set.
You are 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's greet one another today. Praise God. We can dismiss Children's Church while we're at it. Let's quickly put the announcements on the on the screen. And while we do that, we'll get ready for tithes and offering. Prayer on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. We have intercessory prayer headed up by Pastor John. That was an awesome time last Thursday. We pulled heaven down into this room. It was awesome. Yeah, so thank you, Pastor John, for leading us in that. Next, uh, we have baptisms next week. We still have, like, if you want to get baptized, it's not too late to talk to me. We've increased our number from six to seven now. So, uh, yeah, God's really um, convicting our hearts and moving in us. And, and uh, I'd ask, if you're interested to get baptized, talk to me today. I want to see some of the ones I haven't sat down with yet. So, um, so right after the service, if you don't mind, we just want to just see them. What else do we have? Is that it? Praise God. That's, that's quite a bit. We also have one more. Uh, we're transitioning uh, Children's Church from May. She served in, tr uh, in Children's Church uh, for what was a couple of years already. Did a fine job. We are changing over now, and we're uh, putting a pastoral position over the children. So, uh, Christine, Pastor Christine, come up here. She's the one who's leading worship. Yeah, it was awesome to enter into the presence of God, Christine, today. So, t next week we're going to be honoring me, and uh, Christine will be taking over the children's ministry and. Uh, do you have anything to say? <laughs> this is not expected. I didn't, <laughs> so I haven't had anything prepared, but um, I am excited. It's something not only new for, every, a, a, you know, a change for everybody else. It's a huge change for me. Um, this is stepping into something I haven't done before, so I see the Lord expanding in my life and in my heart as well. But I do know that I adore children with all of my heart and I'm excited to just uh, embrace them and work with them and teach them in the ways of God and in the ways of worship. And um, I'm excited for what the Lord is continuing to do through the foundations that May has established and will continue in the lives of these little ones because that's where it's at, hey? I mean, that's where it's at. <laughs> we need, we desperately need people to be willing to help out in children and nursery. If you'd be willing to give a little bit of your time, even if it's, you know, I mean, if you can't do it more than once a month or once every two months, it, it doesn't matter. We just need the help. So um, if you're willing to serve 
in the area of Children's Church or in the area of nursery, please contact one of the pastoral staff. Um, it's not hard. It's not scary. I know that it can feel and seem a little intimidating, but when you are with the children, there are plans. You're not left to make up your own <laughs> curriculum. We do have it all planned out, so we just need people. So please pray about it and see if God is uh, speaking to your heart to be able to serve in that area. Um, <clears throat> also, um, there was one other thing I was going to say. What was it? Oh, yeah. If your child is in the nursery, if you have a child that ever goes in the nursery or goes in children's church, we especially ask that each of those parents take their turn. So if you have a child in nursery, then we really want you to step up and take a turn in the nursery or with the kids as well. So bless you and we'll expect to hear from some of you. <laughs> Praise God. I'm sure it will be awesome. Raising up the next generation is our responsibility, right? Yeah, so let's, uh, let's receive tithes and offering. Uh, have the brothers come up, uh, maybe Scott and, and uh, Adam, and we'll just receive the tithes and offering. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your provision for this family of God. We just thank you that you have established your ways here. And Lord, we just want to respond to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. I don't know about you. For me, uh, in the last... Uh, um, I'm getting corrected here. That's okay. Next week's baptism, right? We're going to have a barbecue after. So uh, bring your towels. You're going to have a beach party. Yeah. So um, my wife is sitting here. forgot something, you know. But it's always nice to have a wife to point things out. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Awesome. Now I can get on with the show. Well, no. Why did I say that? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> For me, I, I, don't, I don't know about you, and I know coming to church has been, in the last month has been kind of a working over in your life. How many of you feel kind of worked over? That's a good thing. You know why? Because you're still breathing. And God is still working on you. He's not finished. He's perfecting his church. Right? And he's perfecting his church to the day of his coming. And uh, we were looking at, at, at a, 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 over a few facts of history in the past little while. And it just feels like, uh, for me, I'm walking in an open revelation as I go. And God is revealing things, you know, uh, in, in my life, in the life of the church, and what is going on around me. And uh, we've been saying in the past that we don't want to be just lukewarm. We don't want to be a Lady of Sin church. We don't want to be a people that, that are just, uh, you know, just on for the ride and just, you know, looking out the window and not being involved and in, in getting off at the train station or getting on the train, all that kind of stuff. Let's be people of action, you know. God wants his people to stand up and be people of action. So with that, 
I want to just say that, you know, God wants to bring revelation to his church. Now, I'm not talking just a book of revelation, okay? We're not, I'm not talking about that, even though that is a revelation given by Jesus Christ to John the Apostle, and it, and it does involve us. But I'm talking about revelation in your life. And revelation is one of those things that if you don't have it, you can't really walk in the fullness of what God has for you. Because all you'll know that there is a God and that's it. Right? Let me tell you that Satan knows that there is a God. I'm not so sure if he has the full revelation of what's really going to happen to him. And, he, you know, he, I, I think he has some sort of idea, but, you know, he's, he's, he's the king of denial. The thing is, we can't be the servants of the king of denial. We can't be walking with our eyes closed and, and our eyes veiled off and our ears plugged to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. You see, we need to come up to a place where we can respond to the Lord at any given time and what he's showing you. And sometimes, let me tell you, sometimes it's not too comfortable. But when it's not too comfortable, notice that it's for your own very good. Because if, uh, if, if, if uh, you always feel comfortable, then really nothing's happening. Honestly, because at times I don't feel too comfortable with what God shows me. Right? So, um, which is an indicator that God wants to change something in my life. And change equals life. Uh, I've got this vine growing in my backyard. It's a grapevine. And uh, I'm looking at this vine, and it's just growing just everywhere. So I cut it back a little bit and it grew shot and it shot right up. So I'm thinking, hmm, you're a little wild on me, so I snipped the top. But you notice that once you start snipping, you start growing different ways, right? So I'm noticing that this vine is changing before my eyes. And it's with any anything with life, God wants to restore you back to what you should be so that what that means is he's going to cut and prune and breathe life into his people a revelation there's two types of revelation one's a general revelation that reveals that there is a God, right? So we can walk outside this door and look around us and see creation that speaks of a God. I mean, you know, there's other things in this world that try to refute that, right? But generally, any, everybody would have that revelation that, you know, there is a creator, and uh, human beings are basically wired that way. Okay? So you're wired within yourself to that there is something inside you saying that there is a God. Right? And of course we have people who are trying to refute that and fight it and fight that tooth and nail. And that's why sometimes that fight is very vicious. Because there's something inside of that person that's being suppressed and they want to justify themselves, right? Okay? The second rev type of revelation is a special revelation that the Lord talks to you personally with, that reveals himself to you, right? So we're going to cover some of this today. But I want to go to the beginning of creation right now.
Actually, I don't. Let me just go to uh, Romans chapter 1. It gives a little overview of these, what we just spoke about. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Remember, we're talking about the suppression, that vicious fight, right? They know that truth, the truth about God because he had made it obvious to them, right? For Ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas for what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshipping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshipped idols made to look like mere people and birds and anim animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their heart desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. And, we, and it goes on to explain different things that humanity conjures up. So this revelation, this general revelation covers three areas. Let's just go through them really quick. Number one, God reveals himself by his work. Right? That's what uh, Romans 1 says. God reveals himself by his work. Second one, God reveals himself through your conscience. Right? Every one of us has a conscience. And our conscience speaks to us, and usually the Holy Spirit speaks through that. Right? So the third one is the world, and God can become a commonplace. Now you gotta, you got to hear me on this one. What happens is if God becomes too common and, uh, and the world becomes too common, that all of a sudden, God becomes something less important. Right? Because we're living this uh, life that we live, we do what we do, we see the evidence of God, you know, we see it, but it becomes commonplace, and then what happens is we don't give him that, that, that due respect or due worship because life just takes over. Right? Am I wrong? You look outside, you know, look, turn on the TV. I mean, people talk about, I mean, different things of creation. They talk about this and that. But then what happens, they start conjuring up their own explanation of why things are the way they are, where we have the answer in his word. So this is really where humanity starts off its quest for seeking out God. Right? So everybody needs to know and needs to come to that conclusion that there is a God. Now we can turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Uh, verse 15. Let's go to that the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it but the Lord God warned him you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil if you eat its fruit you are sure to die then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. That's the best part. Uh, where's my wife? Uh, 
Where's my helper? Mm, yeah. Praise God. Notice here, God reveals himself to Adam and places him in Eden in his work, right? God reveals himself through Adam's conscience because what happens, he says to him, you can eat of every fruit except of this one. So all of a sudden his conscience is put into work. He says, I'm not allowed to eat of that, right? So then what happens, we find that God becomes commonplace in his life. And then what happens? They fall into sin. Right? Because, you know, if Adam didn't know the difference, because every day God shows up and starts providing for him, what other thing does he know? He doesn't know anything else. And it says in the Bible that he, uh, Adam and Eve did not know any shame. Right? He had nothing else to base his life on. He, but you know what? When I was reading this the other day, and, I, and I'm looking at this, and here, here it goes. I'm, I'm heading out on the limb here. If Adam would not have sinned, would he know the grace of God? Would he know what the grace of God means? The big question that happens here is, who is God? And what am I? with him. And uh, notice that when, when Eve, and we can read this in Genesis chapter 3. Let's read this. Verse 1, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. One day he asked him, did God really say you must not eat from the tree of, uh, tree of any, any of the trees in the garden? Notice the question. Did God say that you can't eat of any of the trees in the garden? And the thing is, the question comes to you. Did God say that you can't enjoy life? Did God say that you can't partake of his goodness? No, he didn't say that. But uh, Satan goes on. He says, of course, uh, uh, what the woman replies, or Eve, we can eat the fruit of the trees in the garden. It's the only fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Then the Satan says, or the serpent replies, you will not die. You won't die. Right? And then God knows that your eyes will be opened, and as soon as you eat it, you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The thing is that, that when, I'm, when I was reading this, and I, and I said this to you guys before, and some of you are new in here, that Satan says to Eve that you'll become like God. Where God made Adam and Eve in whose image? They're already like him. Right? So Satan comes onto the scene into our lives and says, you know what? You know, God really is not good. And, you know, he, he, there's more for, in your life than what he can give you. Right? That's what he does. So he comes into your life and starts trying to pull you away from the goodness of God. Right? And what happens? We land into this trap that we start believing that there's more out there and God becomes commonplace in our life, we start hearing other things. Right? We start entertaining other things. And they become a little bit louder in our lives than what God's voice is. But the thing is, we see 
And uh, we're not going to read any more of Genesis chapter 3 right now. But what we're going to look at is at the end, when Adam and Eve are expelled out of the garden, and there's an angel garden the way back into the presence of God, and they can't get back in there. Can you imagine how their hearts would have sank? I can just see it. Oh my God, what has happened to us? Life has changed drastically. Where's my God? God was such a common thing in my life, now he's gone. And that revelation of who he was became stronger because now they are separated from the one who loved him so dearly. And then we, we, look, we look at the, the separation, the doctrine of separation, because our sin separates us from, from God. And the only bridge that we have is the revelation of who Christ really is and who Christ is in your life. So then we have the building up through the ages that God prepares a people for himself to bring in, to usher in the very presence of the living God in Jesus Christ. And you see that people without Christ, without Jesus in their life, are still living this kind of life. Walking an empty life that really has no God in it. Until a special revelation happens in their life. And you know what? Everyone in this room who knows Jesus has had a special revelation of who Jesus is. Because that's your provision today. See, Adam wasn't able to experience that. But he knew God had something in the works because the prophecy of the coming Messiah was in Genesis 3. 16, 15 and 16, where he said that there's one coming out of the seed of the woman that's going to crush your head. You're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to come crush your head, see? And, and then the Lord started to work in the plan of salvation. For me, when I looked at that, it changed my view of my relationship with God. Knowing that the grace of God is extended to mankind and it's so strong. A special revelation comes like this. So you have humanity, right? Humanity likes to follow a leader, right? Likes to, you know, it's like, a, like sheep, right? It's funny because I used to be a bus driver and I became a new bus driver. I'm driving this bus. I don't know if you ever noticed that bus drivers in this, in, in, in this church. But uh, all it takes is a, a crowd of people and one person to make a move and everybody else follows them. <laughs> is that right? And I, and, and I noticed that because... You'd have two buses pulling up to a bus stop, and there'd be a crowd of people, and, and, you, and if you're a late bus, you'd be, part, you'd be stopping way away from this bus stop. You may be the first bus there, but there'll be another one that's empty behind you, and guess where they go? They go to the first one. Right? But the other one stopped right in front of them. So that's the way humanity is, Right? Likes to follow a leader, likes to believe, whatever, right? They, want, they see something happening, so they'll, they'll flock over there, right? It's true, right? And as Christians, we're not any different, right? We see something happening somewhere, we want to go check it out, 
right? We see God moving on. We, will, we like to go check it out, right? So we're, uh, that's the way humanity works. It's, at times it's kind of funny, right? Because just the way we are, like we're sheep. Yeah. And uh, you, when you notice, sheep are the same way. And then, and then when, I, when I had that revelation, I'm going, ah, no wonder we need a shepherd. Right? Because we're, like we're all like sheep. We've strayed away. <laughs> right? So, anyway. It's okay to laugh in church. I'm into that. So, here we go to uh, John chapter 6. Let me just give you a little uh, a little um, introduction to what's happening here. Give you the background. Because otherwise I have to read the whole thing. Right? It might take me a while to read it. But I'll just, I'll just give it to you in story version. So Jesus comes to the scene, right? With all his followers and all his disciples, right? So what, what happens is um, he starts uh, performing miracles. And he starts attracting a crowd, right? So uh, he feeds uh, 5,000 people, 5,000 men. It says in the word that uh, that's only the men. Plus he add on all the women and children, well, to that. So we look, we're looking at probably about over 10,000 people. And then we have, you know, other miracles happening. He raises the dead. He heals the sick. And then we have the 4,000. And so how many of you know if something hap is happening like that, you don't need CNN. The word travels very fast, right? And everybody flocks over and to see what's going on. What is this guy doing? Right? And so they're flocking to see this Jesus. And so Jesus figures, oh, I'm out of here. Right? So he, he goes into a, a boat, right? He, he takes his boat and goes across, across the lake or the sea, whatever you want to call it. Gets it to the other side of Capernaum. And... Well, things happen in the middle of it because um, uh, Jesus is gone and everybody's wondering where he is. The, the, the disciples, they get into this boat and then the storm rages and Jesus is walking on the water and they go, oh, you know. So all this stuff is happening, right? And all of a sudden, you know, Jesus uh, takes everybody onto the other side and they kind of appear there, you know, even though it was storming and it just kind of happened that they're there now. Notice when Jesus comes during the storm, he takes care of you, right? So, I mean, the storm is nothing to him. So, then the crowd finds him because they went to the original place. They're looking for him. They can't find him anywhere. And they notice that the boat is gone. So he must have taken the boat. Right? So they took off to the other side of the lake and they finally find him. And then, then when they get there, they start wanting him to do more miracles. They really want the show, right? You know, they want, they want, they want to see what, he can, what more he can do. Surely he can do more. Right? And so he's saying to, to them, what, what are you guys doing here? You're only following me because you're, you like the show. You like to see the miracles. You like to see all that. And because I fed you, right? You're coming here for the food. And by the way, you know, if you want to fill a church up, you have a barbecue. I found that out really quickly. So, and all of a sudden, he says to them, this food that you're seeking is not what's going to fulfill your life. 
Uh, what you're seeking now is not going to fulfill your life. You got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And so, and that's exactly what they said. What? He says, what are you talking about? How can we eat your flesh and drink your blood? He says, you know, my Father in heaven gave you manna in the wilderness. He gave you bread to eat. I am the living bread. And it kind of freaked them out. It did. It's just like, uh, you know, him preaching here and saying, okay, I'll, I'll, he, instead of eating the bread that you eat at home, you need to eat him. So, and then they're going, huh? And his, we'll pick it up here. After all that, in verse 41 of chapter 6, the people began to murmur in disagreement because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They couldn't get it. In fact, they're so far removed from what he's trying to say that they're seeing knives and forks. <laughs> they weren't seeing what he was actually saying. He's saying, I am your provision. I am what you need in life. You need a revelation of who I am. That's what you need. Because I'm going to the cross and I'm dying for you. There's going to come a time that, you know, I'm going to be removed from the scene because I'm taking on your sin and taking the weight of the world on my shoulders for you. But they couldn't get it. And their response, it was uh, verse 42, they said, Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother, how can he say he came down from heaven? They had no revelation of who he was. Even though he was doing all these miraculous signs, showing them the wonders of God, ministering to their lives, and making them whole on the scene, physically. But their minds and spirits weren't there. They were just, they're just, they said, oh man, this is fantastic. You know, the show's great. Isn't this the son of Joseph? Isn't he the common person we know? You see him every day. He's not that way. Jesus revealed himself by his work. In John 6, 2, he fed. Jesus revealed himself through the conscience of people. Verse 51, I am the living bread that came down, and that he who eats of this bread will live forever. which I will offer so the world may live. This is my flesh. And then they started arguing because it was searing their conscience. They couldn't get it. And then he became this common thing that, isn't he just a son of Joseph? You see, the big deal was there was someone there that they wanted to see, some leader, and, and then they're flocking towards him. Hey, hey, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Gee, there's someone over there we need to go see, right? So everybody, you know, okay. The problem is you can't. Ride on the coattails of somebody else. You can't ride on the coattails of somebody else's faith. Right? It's because what happens, that faith doesn't become yours. 
that revelation of who Christ is doesn't become yours. If you flock somebody else's in this, and I'm talking to even kids and people who have grown up in Christian homes, know that the faith in Christ has to be yours. Know that you can't rely on a spouse. You can't rely on a girlfriend or a boyfriend. You can't rely on your mom and dad. You need to come to your own revelation who, who Jesus is. Because that life is for you. Don't make Jesus just a common thing. That we, I grew up with that, you know, and I'm a Christian. Remember I said last week, I am really disliking that word Christian. Let's not cheapen it. Let's live it. Let's go to uh, verse 60 of, and I think I, yeah, f verse 60 of chapter 6. Many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Notice, many of his disciples Many of the church, verse 61, Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. So he said to them, does this offend you? How many times do we get to a place in church that whatever truth is preached is, is a kind of offensive? Because we're wrapped up in that common thing. And to that thing that we're kind of, you know, kind of gave our, our, our thought and process to, and we kind of think that's, you know, it's okay. You know what I mean? Verse 62, then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to, to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. You can... You can try all you want to get to Jesus and have that revelation Jesus by human effort, but you'll never get there. You'll try and try. You'll try the works. You'll try, you know, being good enough for God, but you know what? You'll never get there because the provision is only in Christ. Jesus says, you come to my provision for you, that's why they couldn't really get it. And so let's see what happens. But some of you do not believe me, verse 64, for Jesus knew the beginning, which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. Wow. You can't fool God. Isn't that something? Verse 65, then he said, That is why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. And at that point, many of disciples turned away and deserted him. Wow. They had no revelation of who he was. It's not something because, you know what? We saw crowds and crowds and thousands of people. Didn't we? We know that, you know, there's a leader. We're going to be flocking again, you know, towards him unless, of course, he says something really hard to us. Then we need to really examine ourselves.
And then Jesus, in verse 67, turned to the 12. There's only 12 left now. Out of thousands, there's 12 sitting there going, what's going on? Let's let, well, can you just see it? Where are they going? It's not going to be a quiet event, I'm telling you right now. I bet you some of them are thinking in their minds, uh, where did all the people go? You know, sometimes, you know, as a pastor, you think that too, eh? You start preaching, going, why are you, where are you going? Because what happens is, the Holy Spirit start ta starts talking into their lives. And start, wants to rearrange the furniture a little bit in the house of God. Right? And then he goes, verse 67, he says, are you, go are you also going to leave? Are you going to leave too? Verse 60, Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. In Matthew 16, verse 13, we have a beautiful picture of what that really, what really is happening here. It says, well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, ask him, who do you say I am? Jesus says, who do you say I am? And some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has given you that revelation. He's revealed it to you. That's that same word. Apocalypse. Or apocalypto, whatever it is they say in Greek. I'm not Greek, so I can't really pronounce it right. It's all Greek to me. But it says revelation of who Christ is. The question is, are you going to leave too? Are you going to step outside the door and, 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 and after church? And, oh, that was all right. Good, good music today and preaching was okay, but, but um, I'll just go on my common life and just do my, what commonly I do without really counting on who Christ is in your life. Note that you can't ride the coattails of others. Because they tried that here. Because what, what happens then is it's much easier to desert something when the crowd leaves. You can go with the crowd, just kind of blend in with them. They never really saw me there anyway. That's the challenge of Christian life. What are you going to do with this Jesus who reveals himself to you? Is he, be is he going to become something that's commonplace, just a thing? Or is he going to become the Lord of your life? Your very provision in life, the one who gives you strength, your healer, your, your, your buckler, the one who's, who fights for you, the one who paves the way for you to be a son of God, the one who, 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 gave, who gave his life a ransom for you and bought you out of, out of, out of sin. Who is this Jesus to you? And make that decision in your life and count the cost of desertion. But you also have to count the cost of following him.
Because you know what? It's much easier to say, forget it. It's simple. You know, we can get into that ostrich mentality, you know, you stick your head in the sand, the world will go away. But we can't do that. That's not what God is calling his church to be. He's rising up a people. There's a remnant of people. There's 12 left. Now we have the church. And know that when you decide to follow Christ, that all of a sudden you become the minority in the world. That's a fact. But do you know that minority is the one that rises up in power and victory? And that's who God is coming back. Jesus is coming back to receive his bride and take her back home with him. We need to count the costs. The bigger cost is when you say forget it. And, uh, and uh, what good is it when a man gains the whole world and loses his soul. That is the call of the Spirit of God to the church in this age. That we need to take that choice and make that choice for him to be our Lord and Savior. Amen? So Christianity has to go beyond general revelation. You are God's children. You are God's children. And when you come into Christ, you become one who is adopted into his family. And you've got a new life to live. Amen? I'm going to... Uh, Stop there. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I just pray that your revelation of your goodness come and inhabit your people. Notice, Lord, I say inhabit. And Father God, you want to tabernacle and live within us, O oh God. And Father God, I just pray that you would help us, give us the strength, Lord, to follow after you, O oh God. Jesus, I you know, sometimes the hardest thing for us to do is to believe. And we see that the crowd the crowd lacked the understanding and the revelation of what you were saying. But Father, I just pray that you would give those who would understand the minority the strength and the power to go out into the world and make disciples. Preach your word. Baptize those who need baptized. Father God, empower your church with your strength. Empower your church to be the, one, the church that you have raised us to be. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. I don't really know how it's going to come out. I'm just going to pretty much close my eyes.
Um, I feel like the past few months, I think, in speaking about revelation, I feel like God just just pulling out this these revelations in my life. Like I'm having these revelations of who he is and like I don't know if you guys have your time with the Lord or if you have that time where you seek him and I felt like I spent years just wanting it like Pastor Rick was saying just trying to do it on my own and just trying to work for it and putting in time and hours and just trying to work for it and I was like God I just need you in my life and I just want to hear from you and I just want to walk in what you have because I know there's something planned for our church and for my family and and God just one day I was just praying and God just said to me you just have to be obedient and just wait and see what I'm going to do be obedient and wait and see what I'm going to do it was almost a challenge to me because I feel like I know I'm 26 years old but I feel like I've waited my whole life to see what God is going to do and I was just in this time where I felt like I was just like, I'm getting older. I know you're going to laugh at that. But I'm getting older, and I don't want my life to pass me by without walking in what I'm called to do. And I would just look at the carnal, and I would look at the flesh that way, and I would just say, we don't have anybody here. We don't have people here. Like, what am I doing? Like, we could be doing worship. I know that sounds terrible but we could be doing worship other places we could go and do worship and we could do all that we could tour we could do all this stuff but then God just said you just need to wait and see what I'm gonna do be, the, be obedient and see what I'm gonna do and I just said okay and it was in that moment I'm serious in that moment my life just switched and my life just turned and I became less about me and less about pleasing my dad and Pastor Rick and the flesh and less about pleasing the moment. And that's what my husband and I talk about. We just as humans so see this moment in time. And we see right now what's in front of us and we just say, oh, that's not enough. But God sees the whole picture of how it's all going to work out. And I just became less about pleasing and doing good worships, making it sound good, and more about just focusing on God. And it was like when I kept my eyes on God and I kept my focus on Him, it was like, I've heard this said before, but it was like my steps are just aligning in front of me. And it's like our, our life is just aligning because when you have this revelation of who God is, and you decide, okay, I'm going to do it. Anybody of my Facebook friends knows. When I, I, I turned from being about posting, yay, Marley is so cute. Look what she said today. Look what she did today. Look at these things. It's so awesome. To everything that I want to come out of my mouth is about giving glory to God. And when I decided I'm not going to look that way at that show or I'm not going to look that way at that drama. I'm not going to look that way at the flesh. I'm not going to look that way at this argument, at pleasing myself about looking good, about doing all this stuff. It was all of a sudden like my life had no choice but to just fall in line with it. And my relationships are just falling in line with it. And I said, God, what is that? Like, what is going on? Like, why do I feel so out of sorts? Because it didn't, like Pastor Rick was saying, it doesn't feel necessarily that awesome. I know it sounds like it's a cool thing, but it doesn't feel that awesome because you're just like, what is going on around me? I'm just so out of sorts. I'm so, like, what's happening? And this is all a, because there's a spiritual realm surrounding your life and things are being taken out of it and being pulled out of it. Like, that, those parts of me are being pulled out. And you're like, God, why do I feel not like me? Like, I'd, I would just walk around and I'd say, God, why do I feel different? And he's like, because you're not living here. I'm living in this other place of constantly just wanting to focus on God. 
and want more of God. And it's like my life has no choice but for everything to align. Finances are aligning. Relationships are aligning. Family relationships are aligning. Like it's like job is, jobs are just aligning, you know, and, and I'm, we're on this journey, but it's not about me and pleasing this time. It's about just giving the glory to God. And I really believe, like, I'm not giving another sermon, but, like, believe about, like, that's why I love living with my parents is because we sit up at nighttime and we just talk about this stuff for hours. And Dad and I were talking the other, Pastor Rick and I were talking the other night, and I just said, like, why doesn't, why don't people get this? You know, like, why am I just, like, am I just weird? Like, I'm just hopped up on this, you know? Like, I'm just, people are getting texts from me all the time. I'm like, we need to pray for this right now. Let's pray for this. Let's intercede. Praise the Lord. And everyone's like, okay. You know, and I'm just, I'm thinking to myself, everyone's getting these texts. I look like a crazy face. You guys know it. You're getting my text back there. And I'm like, do I look like wacky here? And then like, I'm seeing my Facebook notifications are going down. Nobody wants to hear from me anymore. (laughs) Nobody wants to comment on what I'm doing because I'm not talking about how cute Marley is. I'm not talking about what Presley said. Nobody wants to say, yeah, I like that when I'm saying, we need to be falling in line, keep your focus on God. Everyone's like, okay. Nobody likes that comment. Nobody likes that status update. You know what I mean? You, you like it. You always like it. But like, and you always like it. But the rest of the people are always like, what is this? You know, I'm, I'm losing friends. But my focus is on God, and, I'm, and it's a weird thing because those things are being pulled out of me, but I'm not left with nothing. Those places are being filled with things. Like, you are going to lose friends. It's the truth. You are going to lose what you think is important to you. But when you start focusing on God and keep your eyes on that and say, I'm not going to turn away. I'm not going to do it this week and then go back to whatever I was doing last week. I just can't do that anymore. I feel like it's just a weird, and if you guys have been around me, you know that the time it just happened, I was just changed. And I feel like, I I just, I I feel out of it because I'm walking around and I'm saying to Chris, why do I just feel so weird just at this mall? You know, like I'm just walking and I just feel weird. And God just says, because the Holy Spirit is just around you and you just feel weird. Like just, I know God is just playing with me that way. He's just saying, you just feel weird. You know, it's true. I know. I know that sounds weird, but I don't know how else to explain it. But like, I'm just constantly walking in this, this time of like being excited for what's happening. I'm sending Michelle texts. I see the cloud and I know the rain is coming. I know revival rain is coming. And I'm just saying all these things and God is just saying all these things to me. And I'm just, I'm trying to, trying to push and press on. And I'm like, why are people not getting it? You know what I mean? But your time is coming. The time of the church of this revelation is here. We need to focus on God and all of us focus on that rather than this flesh stuff that won't mean anything. Like Pastor Christine was saying, it won't mean anything. Just keep your focus on God and the rest will fall in line. I promise, I promise, I promise that's gonna happen to you. I'm physical proof that that's gonna happen to you. You know what, Adam and Eve, had that closeness with God. They had it. And like Pastor Rick said, my heart just broke when he said they realized they don't have that anymore. They don't, when they broke it, when, when they, when they ate of the fruit and they were cast out, can you imagine knowing the fullness and closeness of that relationship with God, always dwelling right beside him, being in that holy place, being in that time, and then being separated from it. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Like that breaks my heart. So now as a people and as as humans, we are constantly in pursuit of getting back there. We should constantly be pursuing that presence as a people, constantly, corporately as a church. This is the time where we're going to get there. We're going to feel that. Do you not feel that when we're worshiping? Just the holy presence of God is just heavy in the place. That's the time of being close to God. I want to petition you people to seek and seek after the glory of God. Seek after that holy presence time. Really, really do it. However you feel like you're supposed to do it. But just come 
and press it and press closer because your life has to align. It has to align. Those things you are made for this time and your life has to align because your purposes are set like this, not like this. Oh, that's nice and shiny. Oh, those things are cool. Oh, video games. Oh, oh, drama. Oh, clothes and I want to look good. No, your al life has to align with him and the rest will come into place. Anyways, amen. Let's just... You want to pray, Pastor Rick? Okay, let's just stand up and pray. Let's lift our hands up. Heavenly Father, we just come before you as a people, ready, Lord God, ready to align our lives for your purposes, Father. We give this church to you and to your calling, to your purposes, Lord God. We give this time in our families and our, in, our, in our lives, Lord God, for you, Lord. There's no time for anything else, Lord God. There's no even need for anything else, Lord God. When we have a relationship with you and a connection with you and a wholeness with you, Father God, everything else will align and everything else will be fulfilled. We're lacking nothing, Father God. When we are filled with you, we are lacking nothing. Father, it might seem scary, the road is hard, Lord God, and the road is sometimes lonely, Lord, but we are lacking nothing, nothing when we're filled with you. Father, we give our church to you for your purposes, Lord. We give our lives to you, our families to you, and for your purposes, Lord God. We give our finances and our health to you, Lord God, and our emotions to you, Lord God, and those things that the enemy tries to steal away, we say, no, Lord. No, they will not be stolen away, Lord God. They will align for your purposes and align for your calling, Lord. We pray that you would just inhabit our praises, Lord God, and inhabit this place and inhabit our fellowship. We love you and we give our lives to you, Lord God. Today is the day, Lord God. Today is the day that we're changed forever, Lord God. We're changed forever. We have the access, full access to you, Lord God. Nothing can hold us back, Lord God. We come to you, Lord God. Give us that revelation today of who you are. We ask for it. Let's just say that, Lord God. We ask for your revelation. We ask for your revelation, Lord God. Oh, Lord God, give us that revelation, Father God, as a people. Give us that revelation as a church, Lord God, of who you are, Lord God, and of the good things you have planned for us and of the life we have ahead of us, Lord God, and of your glory and of your goodness because nothing else matters, Lord God. In your name, amen. Let's all agree together. Amen. Are you done? Woo. I don't want to leave, but let's go. Have a good week. Oh, barbecue next week and baptism. Pray this week, uh, uh, unless you want my texts. You better pray this week and be interceding. It's a potluck on Sunday, sure, yeah. We'll provide the meat, and we'll be calling you to remind you to bring food. And to pray. Pray this week for those getting baptized. Keep them in your, your prayers. Amen. <laughs>